Hi everyone. Um, my name is Peter Kyo. I am Decarbonized Heat Program Manager with SEAI and today we'd like to give a presentation on the potential of dishwater heating in Ireland. Uh, just to give you an idea of the presentation itself, uh, we're going to have three speakers. I'm going to give an introduction to dishwater heating and its potential in Ireland, kind of a, an outline. Then we're going to have uh, Niall Delaney, who's a lead geospatial analyst with SEI, who's going to give an, an overview of a national assessment for dishwater heating in Ireland and some geospatial analysis and mapping that we've done for some candidate areas. And then we're going to have John O'Shea, a senior energy systems analysis with Kadima, who are the City of Dublin Energy Management Agency, and he's going to give uh, an example of a project out in Tala uh, of a large-scale dishwater heating scheme in Ireland. So before I go into talking about dishwater heating, I just want to give an overview of the heat sector in Ireland today. Uh, it's, a large, it's a large sector and it contributes significantly to our energy emissions. Uh, at the moment, it's responsible for 38% of energy emissions and 24% of greenhouse gases, so a significant player, and these are, are, are still rising today. I suppose it comes to the question then of how we use our heat, and you can see on the graph on the left-hand side where, where our heat users are across residential, commercial, public, industry and agriculture. You can see that residential and industrial applications account for over 70% of our heat demand. I suppose more applicable is the graph on the right hand side, which is um, at our emissions from each sector. And it also breaks it out over what fuel use is used by sector, which you, know, you can see there that we, in Ireland today, we still have a very high reliance on fossil fuels. Gas, oil and solid fuels are prevalent across each sector. I think this is a good graph that gives a good representation of where Ireland is today in terms of our heat. And it, this graph shows the share of renewable energy in our heating and cooling. And you can see Ireland is in the red at the bottom right hand corner, and it's 5.2% share of renewable energy. So that's quite low, uh, especially when you compare it to the European average of 22.9%. In Ireland, we were supposed to reach a target of 12% by 2020, so we're falling short of our current targets. And those tar that gap is getting greater. Every year, we're, we're aiming to achieve a higher share. And by 2030, there's targets of 24%. So we have a significant gap to overcome. And I suppose the question leads into then is how do we, how do we increase our share and how do we reduce our emissions in this sector? The National Heat Study aims at answering that question. It's a, it was a, an assessment, uh, uh, an analysis carried out by SAI that was released in Q1 last year, and it kind of gives an overview of how we use heat and cooling in Ireland, uh, and the technology that we have available today and into the future that will help us reduce our emissions. And then it kind of tied up into a, a final report there at the bottom right-hand corner, the net zero by 2050, which looks at the pathways that we can apply that will help us get to a zero carbon economy. In our, in our heat sector. I'm not going to get too much into the National Heat Study. I'll just touch upon it briefly. We carried out a number, a number of mo model scenarios there to how we can get to a 2050 um, zero carbon. Um, so the first one was the baseline, as, as, as we are today, if we were to continue, where would we be? And then we took a decarbonized gas, which uses the gas network that we have today to, as a vector for decarbonized gas to heat our buildings and homes and industry. Um, the next scenario looked at high electrification scenario, which is using the electricity network, uh, low carbon electricity emissions. And then of course, the balance then with the third one, which is kind of a mix of both and letting the consumer, consumer decide. Um, so those first three scenarios got us to net zero by 2050, but they didn't get us to our 2030 targets um, as outlined. So we took a, a fourth um, scenario, which was rapid progress, which was immediate actions, immediate policy, uh, for the implementation of technologies to reduce our emissions today and reduce our cumulative emissions over the next 10, 20 years. I'm not going to get into these um, graphs too much. They're kind of out of the national heat study. I think what I'd like to draw your attention to is maybe on the right-hand side, you can see the range of technologies that we think we need uh, to help us meet uh, our reduction targets. Um, I think each scenario gives you an idea of when each technology is needed by what date and the rate of uptake that is required. What I will like to talk, talk to you about, I suppose, in this presentation is to bring you back to the dishwater heating. And I think one thing that comes out of the National Heat Study is in all the scenarios that we've assessed, um, that I've outlined previous, in previous slides, dishwater heating is required as a, 
a renewable and sustainable energy source in the decarbonisation of our heat sector. So a, a big action that came out of the National Heat Study was to plan and prioritise district heating, uh, so target the regulatory, planning and financial barriers to the deployment of large-scale district heating screens across Ireland. This has been reflected in the Climate Action Plan of 2023, where we have a target of 2.7 terawatt hours for district heating by 2030. And just to give you an idea of the scale, that's approximately 10% of our residential heat demand. So it's a significant undertaking, and that's um, also reflected in 2025 targets of a 0 0.8 terawatt hour. Um, in response, we've also set up our, the Department of Energy, Climate and Communications has set up a district heating steering group. And it's been established to coordinate the policies and removal of barriers to support district heating going forward. They're currently putting together a report to government which is going to outline the key recommendations to supporting uh, future development and the market of district heating going forward. So I'm going to bring us back then just to our European partners again, just some learnings from abroad. And this graph is slightly out of date, but I think it gives a good indication when we look at Europe and the countries on the right-hand side who are achieving the highest share of renewable energy are those using, you can see in green, is district heating. So we can see that the countries that are achieving the, the best are incorporating district heating. Um, currently at the minute, 9% of Europe is heated with district heating, so it is an established um, technology and it's working today. And we can see that renewable energy is contributing towards heating those district heating schemes. When we bring that back to Ireland, we have less than 1% of our heat sector supplied by district heating, so we have a very immature market in that respect. But I suppose we have the advantage now of being able to look at our European partners and learn from the lessons and experience that they've been able to apply and bring it here to Ireland. I suppose before I go any further, I, I, and acknowledging the fact that it is a new sector, a, a new or fresh market in Ireland, what is district heating? And I think this graph just gives a good indication. Um, so we have on our left-hand side is the heat source. So we're, we're taking heat from an energy centre and transporting it via pre-insulated pipework, similar to a utility like a gas pipework in our roads and um, in public areas and delivering it to our heat users. Um, examples of the heat sources are identified there, but you can have env environmental heat sources like air source heat pumps or geothermal uh, heat pumps heat from wastewater treatment plants, um, CHP plants, data centres, industrial processes, uh, waste to energy, grabbing that heat at a, at a local, at a central location and delivering it then to the heat demand uh, or heat users, which would be the residential hospitals, local authority buildings, um, areas of high heat density. And that's just a photo of what the, the pre-insulated pipework that would look like that would be laying in our high density areas in the roads, pathways, etc., through a town. So why use district heating? Um, I suppose I've gone through it a little bit. You know, the main, one of the main reasons is it helps us to reduce our carbon reductions in a sector that's very hard to decarbonise. But there's a number of other factors that promote district heating. It's flexible and technology agnostic. So it, 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 it allows you to incorporate a lot of technologies, large scale renewable uh, technologies in supplying the heat. Um, we can implement thermal storage for a district heating scheme, so it allows us to balance our electricity grid with wind uh, going forward. So when we have excess wind, we can charge thermal storage, um, our thermal storage and then use it when called upon for heat demand. It improves our air quality in our towns and it also reduces the maintenance costs for our customers. We'll be taking gas boilers out of our properties and it'll be a, a heat exchange unit, so it'll be reduced maintenance for the consumers. It also offers a new market for Ireland, and obviously there'll be a lot of advantages towards that, such as employment creation. It reduces our dependency on fossil fuels, which we've seen in the last couple of years. The impact can be on, on uh, fossil fuels and their prices going forward and our security of supply. And there's also the health and safety benefits with uh, district heating, or removing of fossil fuel boilers from our homes, um, reduces the risk of fire, uh, explosions, uh, and carbon monoxide leaks. Using district heating, obviously, you know, we have a significant scale of district heating allows us to incorporate the economies of scale, bigger, larger scale um, technologies, allowing us to supply lower costs of renewable and waste heat. 
So I, I suppose the question then comes to, we've identified it as part of the National Heat Study that digital heating is a technology that we need to get to our net zero carbon. We know it's a technology that's used across Europe. It's, it's working today. And we know it, can, it allows us to implement renewable energy technology. But where in Ireland can we use it? And that's a piece that um, Niall is going to speak on in the moment. But I'll just, out of the National Heat Study, it, it identified that up to 54% of all heat in Ireland could potentially be delivered from digital heating. So it has huge potential in Ireland. Um, areas of heat density of 1,000 megawatt hours per kilometre has a question mark you know, over that it could potentially support a digital heating scheme. So there is huge potential in Ireland. And that, and that brings me back, I suppose, to um, the piece of work that Niall is going to talk about now, where we looked at candidate areas in Ireland, where digital heating schemes should be, um, it's in a kind of a national level assessment of identifying the locations where we think digital heating should be considered. It has resulted in us releasing a GIS map, which is just available now on the SEI website. It's, um, if, you, if you search digital heating map in Google, it'll, it'll bring it up. But it's, a, it's a, an excellent resource of information. And if there's anything on digital heating you ever want to look into further, there's a lot of data and uh, functionality in that model. So we'd really recommend uh, you, you look into it. And I think I might pass then to Niall, who will uh, get a little bit more into detail on the, the background of the modeling. Thanks very much, Peter, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to spend a few minutes now just talking about some of the spatial work we've been doing in SEAI to identify candidate areas for district heating. So these are areas, as Peter said, that we think have high potential for district heating, uh, but probably warrant some more detailed investigation down the line then. Before I get into that, though, I just want to talk briefly about something called the Census Division. Um, so this is the smallest official geographic division we have of the country. Uh, so if you think about us having four provinces or 26 counties, well, there's 18,641 of these divisions. So they're really quite small. There's about 80 to 120 households in each one. And the purpose of these is for the CSO to publish census results. So they do this once every five years. That's the, that's the main reason they're used. But the reason I want to point them out is that the heat study, which Peter just mentioned there, can almost be thought of as being a sort of census of heat demand. Uh, and the end result of all that analysis is that we have now got a very good understanding of how much demand or how much heat is used by each of these census divisions. And we also know how that heat is used. So we know whether it's in the residential sector, the commercial sector, uh, industrial or in the public sector. And then because we have a very good understanding of the buildings that make up each census division, we have a fair indication of which ones would be suitable for district heating. So what makes an area suitable for district heating? And we'll, we typically look for a few different markers. Uh, the first would be a high level of demand in the commercial and public sectors. These are sort of seen as being a more stable, more reliable demand for heat. Uh, so you often hear the term anchor loads associated with these sectors. Secondly, then, we're ultimately focused on decarbonization of the heating sector. Uh, so we focus primarily on areas where gas, oil, or solid fuel is the main source of heating. Uh, and then lastly is this rule of thumb that district heating works best in areas where you have a high demand for heat in a relatively small space. And that's called having a high heat demand density. So taking those factors into account then, the question is that given we have these targets of 2.7 terawatt hours uh, of, year, of heat per year to be met by district heating by 2030, uh, where should we be focusing our efforts? So to help answer this question, we've developed a spatial model. Uh, at a very high level, this model considers two things. It firstly assesses the heating data from all 18,000 or so census divisions. Uh, and then it also assesses how these divisions relate to each other spatially. So it takes those two primary factors into account, uh, and it forms these distinct clusters of census divisions, which collectively have a high potential for district heating. And this is what we call candidate areas. Uh, so one candidate area will contain multiple census divisions. So I'll just give you an example now of how this model works in a bit more detail. Uh, we'll use a simplified version of it though, and I'm going to simplify it in two ways. So firstly, we're going to use a much smaller target. Uh, we're only going to look at a fraction of the 2.7 terawatt hours. Uh, and then secondly, to simplify it further, we're only going to consider a single slice of the country. So in other words, we're only going to look at the census divisions that fall along this blue line of longitude here. 
and have represented those census divisions as these yellow points. So here's those yellow points again, it's just the map has been rotated now so that we're looking at it from side on rather than from above. Uh, and here's the, the simplified example we're going to use. So suppose we need to cluster a subset of these census divisions along this line into a certain number of candidate areas for district heating. So we don't know how many candidate areas we'll need just yet, just we know that we have to supply 80,000 megawatt hours of heat per year using these areas. And this 80,000 megawatt hours per year, it's just a fraction of the national target of 2.7 terawatt hours per year. Uh, but the first thing we need to do here is look at how much commercial and public sector demand there is at each of one of these points. Because as I said, those are the sectors that are seen as being the more reliable, more stable demand for heat. So we want the candidate areas to be anchored around demand in those sectors. And so here's a represent representation of the demand in those sectors. So this curve is called a kernel density estimation. Uh, in this context, it's just a useful means of representing the relative importance of each area along the line. Uh, in other words, for each census division that falls along the blue line, the height of the curve at that point reflects how important that division is in terms of commercial and public sector demand. So when we view the data in this manner, it becomes a lot easier to see where the most important census divisions are. And I've represented them here as these red points. And we call these red points node points. So that's step one of the model. Step one is identifying those node points. And step two is actually start building candidate areas around them, or around some of them at least. Uh, but the last thing we need to do just before that happens is just to add back in the residential demand. And you can see that slightly alters the shape of the curve. But now the model has all the information it needs to start building candidate areas. So it knows how much demand can be met at each census division. It knows where it can begin building a new candidate area. Uh, and then it also knows the relative importance of each census division along the line. Uh, and in a moment, I'm going to run a little animation here that's going to simulate how this building process works. Uh, and two things are going to happen when I do. So the first is that this blue line running ac across the top of the graph, that's going to start to look, drop down through the curve. And that's just going to simulate the model adding census divisions to candidate areas. Uh, but the second thing is this counter up the top. Uh, each time a census division gets added to a candidate area, that counter is going to increase the amount of demand that's been met by district heating. So at the moment it's at zero megawatt hours, but once the model finishes and it reaches its target, it'll be at 80,000 megawatt hours. So I'll run it now. So here you have the first candidate area being built in, and it's using the most important census divisions. Now we have a second one being simultaneously built, and we're already up to 55,000 megawatt hours. And we have a third one there, and it, just as it reaches that 82,000 megawatt hour mark, uh, a couple of small ones come in at the end. But once the target has been exceeded then, the model stops processing. And in this case, we're left with six, six distinct candidate areas. So we didn't even need to use all those node points that were identified. We only needed to use six. And then if you focus in on just one of those areas, you can see that each candidate area contains multiple census divisions, but right at the center of them then, you've got this peak of, of, uh, peak of commercial and public sector demand. So that's just a simplified version of how that model works. Uh, in practice though, when you're running it for the entire country, it becomes more of a 3D problem. So rather than having this 2D curve, uh, you have this sort of mountainous terrain. But the concepts are very much the same. So when we ran the model over the entire country with the target set for 2.7 terawatt hours per year, we were able to identify 88 distinct clusters of census divisions, or 88 candidate areas which have a high potential for district heating. And I'll just show you so the, the spatial distribution of those areas now. Um, so obviously the first thing that hits you here is just how much of the model target has been met by Dublin City. Uh, but actually then when you also factor in the other three local authorities in in Dublin County, well then the model is suggesting that at least 50% of the national targets could be met in Dublin County alone. Uh, but I think it's also important at this point to highlight that aside from Dublin, uh, there's a lot of towns and cities across the country that, although they're much smaller in scale, uh, have heat demand densities that are just as favorable as pockets of Dublin. And these can't be ignored either because, especially now because local authorities are are required to draw up their climate action plans. And as part of that, they have to plan for these decarbonization zones. So district heating might be something that they want to consider for that. So yeah, it's important to identify that potential for them right now. 
Uh, just in terms of then the sectoral breakdown of the total demand of the total 2.7 terawatt hours. Uh, so the model suggests that the commercial and public sectors could account for 56% of the total demand, uh, with the remaining 44% being made up by the residential sector. Uh, but I think it's actually very interesting then when you look at that in terms of how many connections are required. So the model suggests that the commercial and public sectors account for only 15% of the connections required to meet those targets. Uh, whereas that 15% accounts for 56% of 2.7 terawatt hours. So it just goes to show how important those sectors are going to be in the future for district heating. And then the last thing I want to show you is just the thing Peter mentioned at the start. It's this new mapping service that's been launched by SEAI this week. Uh, it's available at gis.seai.ie forward slash district heating. Uh, and the purpose of this mapping resource is just to allow users like local authorities to explore the results of the candidate area modeling. Uh, so for example, if I zoom in on Drogheda here, uh, you can see that there's a region that's been shaded in orange. And this, is, this orange region is, is one of the modeled candidate areas. It's an area that the model thinks has a high potential for district heating. If I were to click on that area then, you get some more detailed information, like how many census divisions make up that area. Uh, also an estimate of the number of suitable connections in that area and then a sectoral breakdown of the demand as well. We've also added some additional features then to help with the planning process. Uh, so for example, we've added some points for potential anchor loads like hospitals, uh, local authority offices, and some universities and colleges as well. We've also added some points of potential waste heat as well. So in there we have the locations of uh, nearby power stations, industrial sites, or, or data centers as well. Uh, and then lastly, Geological Survey Ireland have provided us with some geothermal data on the suitability of ground source heat pumps. Uh, so ground source heat pumps would be another form of renewable energy that could be coupled quite well with a district heating system. So that's in there as well. So yeah, if you're interested in district heating uh, or if you're involved in the planning for one of these decarbonisation zones and you're interested in exploring district heating as an option, uh, I'd encourage you to visit this map. Uh, but in the meantime now, I'm going to pass you over to John O'Shea, who's going to talk about one of the ongoing projects in Dublin City, or Dublin County at the moment. Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm here to talk about the Tala District Heating Scheme. So, uh, the Tala Scheme is essentially the first large-scale district heating scheme in the country. Uh, it's also the first district heating scheme in the UK or Ireland to use uh, data centre waste heat, uh, which is a heat source that is abundant in Dublin. We have somewhere between 60 and 70 data centres, so uh, yeah, they produce a lot of waste heat that can be utilised. Um, just maybe an introduction to Codema, if you haven't heard of Codema before, we're uh, Dublin's energy agency, we're a non-for-profit public good company set up in 97. Um, team of about 23 people uh, at the minute, uh, and we generally work with the, the local authorities to support them on their uh, energy and, and carbon uh, saving um, targets. Um, so yeah, data center waste heat. So uh, you might have heard this figure mentioned before that by 2028, 29% of all electricity in demand will be used by data centers. So that comes from AirGrid. Uh, and I suppose the key question is, how do we reduce the CO2 impact of all these data centers? Um, and I suppose the first thing to note is that for every megawatt hour that a data center consumes in terms of electricity, about 75% of that is converted into heat. Um, so essentially they're like a big, a big uh, resistor heater, um, <laughs> kind of gobbling up electricity and producing heat. Um, and I suppose that heat is available at a range of different temperatures depending on how they're cooled. So kind of traditional data centers that are air cooled, uh, that heat is rejected at around 20, between 25 and 35 degrees. Or if they're liquid cooled, where they basically put, put the servers into what looks like bathtubs, uh, you can achieve higher temperatures of kind of 40 to 60 degrees. So it, in those cases, it potentially can even go up to, to 80, uh, depending on uh, whether you're targeting kind of the specific CPU uh, chips. Um, so in some cases, you mightn't even need uh, heat pumps to, to capture that waste heat and use it. Um, so this is a, a map we put together in Codema of the different heat sources. In Dublin, there's around 530 different heat sources. Uh, we're talking about you know, surface water, so rivers, uh, canals, uh, deep geothermal is a large gray area, 
the lots of red is the data centers. Um, yeah, and we also have things like combined heat and power plants that might have, uh, have excess heat, uh, industrial sites that might have excess heat, um, you know, things like cold storage warehouses that reject heat. So, uh, yeah, loads, loads of different sources. Uh, and I suppose when you add those all together, we found that uh, there's enough uh, of these heat sources in Dublin to heat 1.6 million homes, which, you know, far exceeds the number of homes in Dublin. Uh, and I suppose what we're going to focus on here is uh, the TALA scheme, which is indicated by the map, or by the arrow on the map. Um, so the, the TALA district heating scheme, as I said, uses data centre waste heat, and it was uh, a project developed by South Dublin County Council as part of uh, the Interreg Northwest Europe project, which looked at developing uh, fourth generation district heating in Northwest Europe. Um, and Kodima were the, the project lead uh, on that project. Um, and fourth, fourth generation district heating is kind of the most, uh, I suppose, the um, latest technology in terms of district heating. Um, I suppose the first key step to kind of realizing this project were, uh, went back to the planning department, I guess, in South Dublin County Council, where they um, introduced, um, you know, text around promoting the use of, of waste heat within the county. Uh, and as part of that, any uh, industrial site that was um, either expanding or being built in the area had to do a number of things in, uh, as part of their planning application. The first of which was to produce a waste heat report, which basically said how much waste heat uh, they would have on site, uh, how much of it, uh, what temperature it was at, uh, to, to help assess, um, I guess, how viable it would be to use it for district heating. Um, the second thing is if a district heating network was either planned or installed nearby, then that site would have to install the heat recovery equipment to bring that heat to the boundary of their site for connecting into a network. Um, and I suppose the, the third thing that that allowed to happen was basically open the dialogue between you know, the waste heat owner, in this case the data centre, and the council who want to develop the, the district heating network. So that was a, an important first step to kind of have the initial discussions and share data, etc. Um, so in terms of the kind of design concept, what we have is the, the heat coming out of the data center at about 25 degrees, um, and it's brought to our energy center where we have uh, a, a number of multi-stage heat pumps that raise the temperature to between 70 and 85 degrees, uh, and that's pumped out through this uh, network of insulated pipes to the various buildings where they absorb the heat and then return the cooled water back to the energy center to be reheated again, so it's a closed loop system. Um, so it, what we have installed there at the moment is three megawatts of heat pumps, um, but there is space in the energy center to add more heat pumps into the future as we get more and more buildings on the network. We also have a three megawatt electric boiler, uh, which is used as uh, backup primarily if there's uh, any issue with the heat pumps or they're down for maintenance, uh, or there's any issue with uh, getting the waste heat from the data center, we can, we can use those. Um, and I suppose these kind of two electric uh, heating systems as well uh, will allow us in the future to uh, support the electricity grid by providing demand side response. Um, and I suppose uh, currently installed, uh, so we, we have planning to install uh, thermal storage as well, so essentially large flasks uh, next to the building that can store around 15 megawatt hours of, uh, of heat, so they're kind of 12 meter tall flasks essentially. Um, but at the moment, the, the storage we have on site is basically we're using the thermal mass of the buildings connected to store the heat, and we can also use the insulated pipe network itself for storing heat. Um, so yeah, I guess in terms of the, the kind of benefits of the scheme, so as I mentioned, it's the first large-scale district heating scheme uh, in the country. It's the first non-for-profit public utility in the country as well. Um, the kind of initial phase of the project will save about 1,500 tonnes of CO2 per year. Uh, and it's a fully fossil-free solution, so there's no fossil fuels being burnt on site, it's fully electric. Uh, and as a result of that, we, you know, we've got cleaner air, so there's no particulates. Um, as I mentioned, we can use off-peak electricity to you know, use cheaper nighttime electricity, store it, and, uh, and then distribute it during the day. Um, we're, utilize, or we're using waste heat, which currently has no value, um, so we're using a kind of a free heat source that's currently being dumped into the atmosphere. Um, and as a kind of a benefit, I guess the, the system also provides uh, free cooling as a byproduct of absorbing the heat from the data center, so it reduces their electricity use, their water consumption as well. Um, and as I said, it integrates the electricity and the heat markets to, to allow us to, to support that electricity grid. Um, I suppose the, the benefits in terms of, uh, so a lot of developers are really interested in this project. We, we get uh, regular phone calls from developers in the area because 
they see it as a real cost-effective solution for them to comply with their Part L uh, um, requirements. So it's kind of lower cost than you know installing heat pumps in each individual house. I suppose there's improved reputation and it has a bit of a cool factor, I guess, the fact that you're getting waste heat from a data center. Um, it improves the renewable energy proportion uh, in the building as well. There's also trench sharing opportunities. So if you're installing fiber optic cables or electric cables on your site, you can install uh, pipe work at the same time and you can share the cost between the developer and the district heating uh, developer as well. There's less noise compared to air source heat pumps, which typically are in the kind of 40 to 60 decibel range, which is kind of like light traffic kind of noise. Um, there's no carbon monoxide or gas leak risks because there's no gas used on site or no burning on site. There's lower maintenance costs because there's no moving parts really, it's just heat exchangers in the buildings. Uh, and also, you know, it's, I guess, district heating is a solution that's been used across multiple countries in Europe to tackle fuel poverty. So it's, uh, it's a lower cost alternative, especially when you look at it over, over a longer time horizon. Um, and there's also space saving as well. So you don't have to have your, um, you know, your hot water cylinder uh, in your apartment safe that you would have with a, with a heat pump. It's, it uh, saves up that kind of meter square within your apartment, which uh, in Dublin, it, it costs about 2,350 euros per square meter. So when you add all that up, it's, it's uh, quite significant. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, what do we pay for the waste heat? So the waste heat is provided for free. And the reason it's provided for free is that it provides these multiple benefits to the data center as well. Um, I suppose it provides that kind of high, uh, or it provides free cooling which gives uh, that kind of high combined efficiency. Um, I suppose it's uh, another way that they can, um, you know, address their corporate social responsibility, you know, other than doing, you know, corporate PPAs. Um, they can provide this kind of local, their local community with a low carbon uh, heat supply as well, which uh, I think is great for, you know, their relationships with their neighbors and reduce their water consumption, as I mentioned. So. I think uh, every cubic meter that, of water that they use in their cooling towers that uh, evaporates, um, you know, costs them two euros and they use quite a lot of water. I suppose it also provides an addis, uh, additional uh, health check on their system. So we, you've got a separate organization whose whole focus is uh, your cooling system. So if anything happens with that, uh, they, can, they can let you know on this kind of an extra layer of, of uh, comfort with that. Um, there's also potential to, to reduce their capacity charges. So as I said, it reduces their electricity consumption on site and can reduce the, uh, I guess, the requirement for on-site cooling plant as well and the space and cost savings associated with that, but also the uh, reduction in capacity charges for their maximum in-court capacity. So there's uh, a number of benefits there. And there's two that weren't relevant for this site, but might be relevant for other data center sites. So Basically, if they've got on-site uh, combined heat and power where uh, they're generating electricity on-site, uh, we can absorb the, the waste heat from that to kind of boost the efficiency of, of that process. Uh, and potentially, they could earn revenues for, from, uh, you know, selling their waste heat as well. Um, I guess, yeah, so some of the learnings as well from the project. So uh, on the procurement side, we had this kind of output-led approach uh, where we kind of had a list of client requirements uh, that were kind of set in stone around the CO2 content of the heat, the renewable energy content of the heat. Um, and we kind of allowed, I guess, the, you know, the, the um, ESCOs who were tendering for the project to use their expertise to arrive at the best solution um, to achieve these things without us being overly prescriptive. And that also allowed us to do um, less uh, kind of detailed design work and leverage their experience in terms of, of design work as well. So the ESCOs bid in with, with a heat price, essentially. So it was all baked into a, a heat price. So they could decide whether they wanted to invest more in better equipment if they thought they were going to recover that cost over the duration of the contract, which is 10 years. Um, and then a portion of, of the kind of capital expenditure as well um, is paid back over the duration of the contract. So it, it ensures that the ESCO maintains skin in the game throughout the operation of the, of the network as well. Um, and then I suppose, uh, the, yeah, as I said, that, that kind of allowed us to apportion the technical risk to the person who was, uh, you know, best equipped to, to deal with that, being the, the, the ESCO who was tendering for the project, um, while also allowing the, the district heating company, which is owned by the local authority, to retain the ownership and control of the asset.
Um, in terms of kind of handling risk then in the contract, our kind of general approach was, you know, quantify the potential impact first. So we'd done a lot of detailed modeling of the network and how it would operate. And we were allowed to, you know, vary certain things to see what the impact would be. And using that information then it allowed us to decide whether we could just remove that from the contract or simplify it. Uh, just so that when, um, I guess, simplifying it so that when all the engineers were gone, uh, the kinda, there was no disputes over how things should be calculated or this or that. So we kind of have uh, a lot of these kind of calculations in Excel spreadsheets. So if one variable changes, then it makes a certain change to the contract and you don't have to bring, bring all the engineers uh, back around the table, you know, six years down the line when they've all forgotten about uh, what happened in the project. So uh, that was kind of a, a general learning from the project. Uh, in terms of expansion, I suppose the, the kind of TALA local area plan area is kind of the general area we're looking at. And there's about 27 additional buildings in close proximity that could uh, provide further demand for the network. Um, I suppose, as I said, the, the district heating connection uh, out of the energy centre is future-proof to be able to take all the waste heat that's available from the data centre. So it's not taking all of it right now, but it can take it into the future uh, as the uh, network expands. Uh, there was also additional space set aside within the energy centre for additional heat pumps uh, in the future and also um, space for uh, thermal storage into the future as well. Um, uh, and then <clears throat> uh, in terms of um, additional connections, so uh, within the contract, the, the council who are the district heating company uh, or who own the district heating company reserve the right to go to market for any extensions to the network. Um, you know, but first they, they'll uh, offer it to the ESCO who built out the network, and if they think the price is a bit too high, then they reserve the right to, to go out to the market as well. Um, and then I suppose in terms of security of supply of, of heat, uh, we're also looking at diversifying the heat supply. So, uh, so we're not fully reliant on, on the data center into the future. We're looking at things like geothermal in the area uh, and other heat sources that we could utilize in the locality uh, into the future to both allow the network to expand, but also uh, provide an extra um, layer of resilience on top of what we have there already. Uh, yeah, just to mention as well, uh, just in wrapping up, that we also put together this data center waste heat policy recommendation paper with uh, Euro Heat and Power, who are the European kind of trade association for district heating. So there's uh, some uh, interesting information in that for, for people who are interested in, in, in the area. Um, and just to mention as well that we have some uh, further schemes that we're uh, looking at at the moment. So probably one that's most uh, relevant to, to Tala is Blanchardstown, where we're looking at another um, scheme that'll use waste heat from a data center, but it's about four times the size of, of Tala. Uh, and we're looking at heating the National Aquatic Center, Connolly Hospital, the TUD campus in Blanchardstown, uh, some of the pharmaceutical sites as well uh, in the area. So um, yeah, that's, that has potential to be quite a, quite a big scheme and will potentially use more than the heat from more than one data center, uh, given the demand there. Uh, we're also working on the Pool Bag uh, project, which has taken waste heat from the energy from waste plant. Um, we're looking at uh, the Grange Gorman campus, where we're looking at deep geothermal there. Uh, and we're also looking at uh, Grange Castle, where, uh, again, we're looking at uh, waste heat sources within the industrial park there to heat uh, nearby developments in, in Clonbar. So, yeah, if you have any projects in those areas and you're looking for uh, renewable heat uh, opportunities, I guess, um, feel free to, to get in touch with us. Uh, and, yeah, hopefully we can uh, make a project happen in those areas as well. So, thank you very much. Um, I would take any questions if there are any out there. Hi, I'm just wondering if you've looked into the potential for working with renewable energy communities in terms of, you know, capturing those benefits that could be going to developers but might also be going to community, like as a community benefit, both in terms of things like affordable housing but also free heating. Uh, yeah, so we've been in touch with a few of the SECs actually uh, who are interested in the area. I know around, um, especially for the Grange Gorman one, some of the local SECs are interested in a uh, potential expansion of that network to, the, to their uh, neighborhoods. So yeah, we, we have been in touch with a, with a few of those. Um, so yeah. 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 Uh, 
If that's it, if there's no more questions, I'd just like to say thanks very much. And we'll be hanging around here for a few minutes as well if anyone wants to come up and have a chat. Uh, but yeah, thanks very much.